just disregard the fact that we do have a national league right now in Washington and nationwide, the discussion. And it came about, as you know, because we have laws against entering the country without going through the due process. And at the same time, we have something like 11 million people here today. It's a real problem. But I can tell you, reading this document, if you kind of look at it through the lens of documented immigrants, and then you look at it through the lens of undocumented immigrants, it takes on a very different connotation. So I think it's important for each of the recommendations that we develop that we're clear about what distinctions we're making. Doesn't necessarily mean that undocumented immigrants are excluded. I wouldn't want to see a landlord, for example, be able to take advantage of anybody, regardless of their status. But I think to try to minimize the significance of the difference between those two groups uh, is wrong. And, and it is for a couple of reasons. For one, uh, my wife, for example, is an immigrant. She was a British subject, and it took her five years like to get a green card and then to get naturalized. And she's now a proud American. Uh, I think that the people who are waiting in their home countries patiently to go through that process legally uh, kind of deserve a sort of protection to justify the fact that they're going to that public. Uh, so although I recognize that we have a bad situation with a law that's not being enforced properly and people who are able to come here anyway, I wouldn't want Charlotte to become an inviting haven for people who have circumvented the law. I wouldn't want us to become a party to a circumvention of federal laws. So I'm generally in favor. There are a lot of provisions in here that I could agree to readily. But uh, I just want to say as a general comment as we enter this process, that each of these points should be considered with an understanding about the distinction we're making between documented and undocumented uh, immigrants. And that where that distinction is important, that we need to be thoughtful about what applies to them. Thanks, Council. A lot of you guys still sitting around the table to have this conversation. Um, I think the motivation on my part had everything to do with the economic development problem as much as the social problem. Um, economically, the immigrant population has um, a significant amount to do with the entrepreneurial world, has a lot to do with um, bringing back the revitalization of the inner city communities and other communities. It has a lot of benefits that I'm not sure we were fully embracing. the most and what started the conversation. I know there's some controversial pieces to it. Uh, the ID went to me, I'll be honest with you, was controversial. It's still somewhat controversial. I want to work through the policy implications or work through the uh, budget implications. But it was really telling me this weekend I got an email sharing with me that the police chief and sheriff are embracing this and I hadn't thought about it from their standpoint. So thank you for that information. Uh, we have to make sure that we take all policy conversations. It's not just the one that you're talking about. But with the sheriff and the police chief for embracing as well, it would do somewhere in this process to have them come to talk to us about their, their considerations and why this is important to them as well. Um, so I would hope we don't just kind of get off on one day of this conversation and think about um, a, true, um, a true benefit to the, the full community, including the criminal justice um, components of the community. So I have more to say downstairs, but I just want to make it to the conversation. Uh, Thank you for your diligence and your perseverance and your commitment to the community. And then there's a lot of other people in here tonight that were not on the task force. And I think it's significant and important to also recognize them for coming forward and showing their support for this kind of exercise in the community. Um, uh, I understand that there's a lot of concern in the community about a municipal ID and what the ramifications of that would be. But I also got into appreciation from, from spending some time last year with Deputy Chief Kirk.
Eric Putney. And we were on a trip and talked a lot about how significant a municipal ID would help the police department in not only being able to identify people, who those people are and where they live, but also help help the police department by encouraging the community with that ID to report when they are victims of crimes. And that just makes the whole community a better place. So uh, I commend the task force for its work. I hope the city manager will uh, really scrutinize all these recommendations. Uh, there's going to be pieces that uh, we're probably going to want to come back and refer to different committees. There are going to be pieces that can be brought to council for an up or down vote right off the bat. But we also have to have some engagement with some outside partners, especially in the entrepreneur areas. And I'd also be interested in a cost uh, value benefit analysis of some of these measures also, uh, so that we can have the best understanding of if it's going to require the council to make an investment in the effort, what is the benefit that's going to be coming back to the city at large? That's it. Thank you, sir. I think it's very important that we know where people are, that they come out of the darkness and report if they're afraid of harm, which they are. They're afraid to go to banks, and people know they have cash, and they go after them. And this way, if they're registered, they do not, they're not afraid to go to the police. And maybe that will be a less of a problem. And very practical note, when I go around, I get the police back on it. My answer is, I don't know what to call us, Native born Americans. We are not having children. And if you want Social Security to last, you're going to have to welcome these people and pay it, and we'll pay it out as time goes on. And that's a thing. And I want to tell you, it changes minds, because I have a lot of older people, especially old conservative gentlemen, who give me this pushback, and I say, look how much in Social Security, it won't be there. If they're not there, to pay for it. Uh, my understanding from demographers is that um, almost the entire growth in our workforce right. going forward in the next half century is going to come from immigrants and their children. Uh, just I want to say congratulations on uh, just your, your hard work. I know this was a, a long and arduous task and also just like the city council and the believer in diversity, uh, race, gender, sexual orientation, gender expression, as well as documented and undocumented people here in Charlotte that asked for our great but also popular call Charlotte. The uh, community ID, uh, who, who else would be able to utilize this? This is not just for immigrants. There's a broader perspective in use of this that could be uh, applied to all Charlottes. Can you share a little bit with that? The homeless, the elderly, some students, you mentioned the transgender. Those are all groups of people that have difficulty obtaining a photo identification for it. And this community ID can help them all. The, the idea that we're proposing is an idea that would benefit everybody in the community because it would have multiple uses. We wanted to, to partner with the city agencies, for example, with tax, and the, be able to use it for transportation, maybe for parking, to use it as a library card. And we met with the uh, public library and they, they have an interest. They already issued a card. We could talk to museums and different venues to see if they would do a discount. In other words, to add value to this card. So now you can use this card for transportation, for parking, to enter a restaurant and get a discount. That ID would benefit everybody. And that's consistent with the, the vision of the task force, which is to do things that improve and help everybody in the community. Uh, my colleague, uh, Ken Smith, just referred to the fact that it's possible to get an ID now for $10 to it looks like the main beneficiaries of any action we take on IDs would be people who are not documented. And I guess I have two questions. For one, what sort of information and proof do they have to provide in order to get the ID? And the second one is, do we know how many of them are going to be willing to step forward and be captured in some database? I, I think the anxiety about lots of people who are undocumented is that their information will somehow, maybe even at a later date, find its way to into the hands of uh, ICE or whatever. And if we're giving them assurances that that won't happen, uh, that once again puts us, in my mind, in a position where we are really actively aiding and abetting the 
circumvention of immigration laws. So again, how many people are likely to apply for these IDs given the apprehension about how the data could be spread around? Um, I, I guess is my main question. And uh, uh, we really expect that a lot of people will want them if they could get the $10. Well, there's a lot of things you asked about, but let me just say that it's not that easy for everybody to get an ID at the DMV. Yes, you have to be, you have to show proof of legal residence, but some of the homeless don't have that here. And transgender have a difficult difficulty. There's students that don't have IDs. So there's there's a segment of the population outside of undocumented immigrants that have difficulty getting an ID. Nevertheless, you do have undocumented immigrants here that don't have an ID, and you have the problems that I addressed. I want to address this problem. Some of the questions that you're asking really require the city staff to investigate. But I can answer what other cities are doing in terms of proof. It's not like somebody would show up and say, my name is Jose, give me an ID. This person would have to show you certain documents. The problem is he has ID for his country, and they won't, they won't be recognized, they won't be understood here. It could be a passport from Mexico. It could be a cedula from Mexico that the police officer doesn't understand and won't recognize, and he could have some other identification. So in other cities, they've listed the different forms of identification they've had to come forward with, and depending on how good they are, they might have to bring more than one. In addition, you have to bring something showing the proof of residency in, in the city, the town, wherever the, the area is. So it's not like you're going to give an ID to somebody who has no ID. You're just going to give them an ID that's more recognized here. So the next time he's stopped by a CMPD officer, the CPD officer will have some, some, some understanding of who this person is. He won't have to arrest him merely because he doesn't have an ID, which is very expensive for us also. And it's very destructive for the immigrant to be taken down for almost no reason just because he doesn't have an ID. We think there's going to be enormous demand of people that are going to want to have this ID here just from, from seeing what's happening in the other communities. We don't know how many are going to be, but we certainly expect there to be a very large number of the community that will come forward. But again, these are things that the city staff now has to determine how to best implement this. What's the cost going to be? Are we going to partner with some of the organizations, like I mentioned, so that the minimal cost to the city in New York? They came out and they're paying for it all. They're making the IDs free of charge for everybody. So they, there's just a lot of questions that need to be answered by the city. But I do want to finish one thing. You mentioned that. Uh, You'd like to benefit from immigrants here. Let me tell you, you have to benefit from immigrants. They've been working here for the last 20 years. And nobody's asked whether they're documented or not documented. When the immigrants build in the house, cooking your dinner, working at the hotel, they're just immigrants. They're just working hard. And they've helped us expand our economy here. And so the, we have a, yes, we have a national immigration issue. I know a little bit about immigration law, because that's what I practice. And do you know do you know that it takes some people more than 20 years to stand in line in order to become a legal resident here? It's, it's a broken system. Meanwhile, for years, we've been inviting them here with great jobs and being welcome. So it's pretty hard now to say, no, I don't think anybody really believes that's going to happen. What happens is we got two political parties that can't quite get together on the benefits. The one party likes them because they think they're going to be future voters. And the other party likes them because of the economic benefit. They will someday get together. And we'll have immigration reform, and this issue will be gone, maybe for, for now at least. But right now, we, need to, we have an opportunity here in Charlotte. We can't change immigration laws. What are we going to do here in Charlotte? That's what the task force was brought to do, to come up with strategies to integrate the immigrants we have here to help them improve economically and civically so we can all benefit. And this is the opportunity we have right now, and we should take it because other cities are lining up to do that.
certain extent, I'm just signaling to the staff and then to the task force that some of the conversations we're going to need to have uh, in order to be able, in fairness, to people who are not in the grants, for example, uh, who are also struggling to establish businesses and get ahead, and might look at some of the things we're talking about here and say, hey, you know, what about me? And there are just a lot of conversations we need to have, and there are issues related to the status of federal laws, our constitutional responsibility to uphold those or not to act in direct violation of those. Uh, so this is a, con a conversation that will continue. Just want to let you know, I think immigration as such, we believe, is a very powerful thing in the world. Thank you. We really work hard. The representatives on the task force who represented certain immigrant communities to reach out and ask. And there, there were certain people on the, on the task force who worked with communities that we didn't necessarily hear from, but that through the, their work with them were able to give certain perspectives. But we, it was really our intention to reach a broad cross-section um, from service workers to very successful entrepreneurs. Um, it, it was our task to look at all immigrants, not one particular segment. 